This is the Startup Reading Podcast, created by a group of founders, funders, and entrepreneurs who believe you can have a thriving startup ecosystem in any city in the world. So they created one in theirs, Reading, California. On this episode of the Startup Reading Podcast, I'm excited to share with you the story of Limelight Health, told by Garrett Vickers, one of the co-founders of this amazing company. Limelight is one of the companies that has come out of our ecosystem, and we're super proud of where they are on the journey and where they're headed. Garrett is going to share with us what it took to get the company launched, how they raised the millions of dollars they were going to need in order to scale this company, and then his personal journey of walking through the entrepreneurial experience. Many of us are aware of this, the part of the experience that we call the Valley of Sorrows, where things get really hard. Garrett certainly hit that place. And as a highly creative musician, one of the ways he processed that was by writing songs. And so at the end of this episode, he's going to share an original song with us that he wrote in the midst of one of those valleys. So stay tuned to the end for that. We're here today with Garrett Viggers, co-founder of Limelight. Now, I've always just referred to it as Limelight. Is that the full name of the company? No, sir. It's Limelight Health. So you're in the you're in a health space. What does that mean? And why did you name it Limelight? I was one of the co-founders that did the or that, that won the uh, GoDaddy URL uh, search for a for a dot com. And we thought we'd, we'd have health in it because we're in the health insurance space. We started in the health insurance space. And. I, you know, I was doing a bunch of Googling uh, or in GoDaddy for what had health and what had to .com. And somehow we landed, I forget the other ones we had, but Limelight Health was, uh, and then we kind of put a spin on it to, uh, because we're a B2B solution. We want to put you in the limelight. It's, it's actually cheesy, but um, it's a whole white labeled solution for businesses. And we're not the hero. They're the hero in the story. We have the technology. So it works. Give us a little bit of a sort of a framework. What does Limelight Health do? We are a technology platform that we have a few different products, right? So um, at the end of the day, we help uh, good decisions be made when shopping for mainly small group insurance products, medical, dental, vision, life, disability, you know, critical accident, all the products that employers provide their employees. There's a whole uh, process that goes on for that to happen. So we enable that process to be efficient. Nice. So you talked about some co-founders. How many co-founders do you have? And what was that journey like putting that together? We have uh, there was four co-founders that started. Actually, there's two of us in Reading. So this, the story of Limelight from a co-founder perspective was, was I started Windfall App Technologies about six years ago. And Alan Laird is in Reading. He's our CTO now uh, and has always been. We both started. I was the product visionary and, and, and kind of designed it uh, with a friend and we made a prototype. When we started Limelight, we brought on Jason Andrew, our CEO, and Michael Lujan, who was our chief sales uh, officer to begin with. Uh, and that created the four of us. And we, t we started Limelight Health February 2014. So Alan and I were doing something about a year prior. We met uh, uh, Michael and, and Jason, who were trying to do something through Obamacare with all the disruption and the law changes. And I had showed them my mobile phone app, which is the, what we had. And then we met and the four of us launched Limelight together and we focused on small group insurance, not individual Obamacare, because there's a lot of difficulty in that market. So, okay, so four co-founders filling out those roles, product, what'd you say, product technology, CEO and sales, right? So covering your bases there. Yeah, I would say it's a killer, killer, a good spread. I don't necessarily rec know if I, four is a lot, right? But in, in tough and in tough markets like the insurance, you need to have fill the roles, right? So I was the product visionary, Alan could build it. Jason, who was our CEO, was fundraising and just knew how to run, knew how to run a company and start it. And Michael was our door opener. He's from the industry, long-term door opener sales. And that was a great team. When you say you don't necessarily recommend four, what is that based on? What do you mean by that? It's it's kind of like, if, if you're like, hey, do you, <laughs> do, do you believe in polygamy? Right? Do, do you do you believe in having more than one wife? I don't. I don't. I think one is good. So two to me is is I think uh, a good number. Three, and uh, forget the wife analogy now, but just purely co-founders. Um, you know, it's it's uh, 
it depends what, what, what space you're in, I think. So if you can do it with two, that's awesome. You can make quicker decisions. You can move faster. If you're present, you know, together in the same eyeball to eyeball, that's awesome. When you get three to four, it just creates dynamics and difficulties, right? Because you've just got more to account for and it's, it's harder to, to move with four. So there's, there's benefits to having somebody like a door opener on the team at a co-founder level, obviously, but it just comes with complexity is what I hear you saying. Is that? Yeah. And again, is that right? I think for us in the insurance space, the difficulty of this industry for is, was it, we couldn't have done it without the four. So I feel right. like for us, but if you're like creating a little widget for something you can sell direct to consumer, you know, it's totally, it maybe is not necessary. Um, but for us, it was really critical. Can you sort of walk us back to the 2014, 2015 era when you guys were just getting this thing off the ground um, and just give us a little insight into what did it take to get Limelight Health started? Um, I, I, I was, I ended up, so I'm a musician, right? Ended up kind of moving, my path moved because music didn't really support my wife and kids. So I ended up helping, uh, uh, my mentor, Jim Phillips, start two businesses in the insurance space. So I got licensed. I was um, able to uh, be able to be a broker, right? So I helped small employers and I felt the pain. At the end of the day, I felt the pain and that's what led to solving this pain with our product. So I was living the world as a broker the first year of Obamacare, right? No one knew what the heck was going on. And you had people saying, you know, I don't know what's going on. And you know, I'm going to, my kids are going to be on a Blue Cross plan. I mean, Medi-Cal, mom and dad are on a, you know, a Blue Cross plan. It was complete chaos and it was confusing. And it, it was basically uh, a calculation of what was your income and your household family size. That was a calculation that told you what silver plan you qualify for and, and what your cost would be, right? So that was the problem that I solved to start before Limelight started and i found alan alan had vintner's wine cellar back then and i was actually playing music in his um in his wine shop and and he said yeah i make mobile apps i said awesome let's let's make a mobile app to feature local artists musicians i was yeah back when yaks was all in reading they had live music that i was helping spearhead uh and and we we made an app and so i had a working relationship with alan making a native app with featuring artists in reading musicians, filmmakers, photographers. And, uh, and then I came back to him and said, Hey, there's this new law. It's called Obamacare, Alan. Why don't we make an insurance app? He's like, Oh, wow. That sounds pretty exciting. Not really. And, uh, so I went, I went and prototyped it and he and I like in a few nights prototyped this little native phone app before limelight, about a year before limelight. And, uh, and then we prototyped a better version with Scott Davis, who was a friend of mine, dear friend, a drummer, musician. And it looked, then he made it look really pretty. And then we actually took it down to Covered California, which is down at the largest exchange, right, in the, in the nation. And Michael Lujan, our, one of our co-founders, was running sales and marketing. So I texted him, found him, said, look at my app, it's awesome. And uh, he couldn't do anything because he worked for the, uh, for the state. So then, but he left. So when he left, he called me. He said, hey, what are you doing? I like what you're doing. I like your energy. You got vision. You, you're not just angry that the insurance industry is changing like a lot of people were and a lot of people are. I, you're being a, a good force, right, of change. And, and so then he talked to Jason, our CEO, brought us together and uh, February 2014 is when, uh, when we started but at the end of the day, right, I felt the pain as the first user, right, that build a product. I was a broker. I got, I knew the problems. People at the soccer park saying, hey, Gary, you're a broker. What happens with this, this? And I had no good answer. So I, I created our first Obamacare subsidy calculator. You know, Alan was able to build it. To my ears, I hear a couple of things just really stand out there. One was you and Alan met because you were chasing your passion. And actually he was too, I, you know, his downtown wine shop was a big passion project for him. You're playing music and that's actually what brings you together and creates the space for you to actually do something that now we would argue is outside of your passion or at least the passions that were alive. Then you followed your passion and went through it into something else, which I think is interesting. Yeah. It's, I will say the first few years was pretty difficult 
because the passion and what I, you know, what I, what I was passionate about, but couldn't feed my family created this, mm -hmm. this need, right. To color outside the lines, which became limelight, which took me a few years of really struggling with who, who I am as a person. And it, you know, the, it's like kind of like going into the IBM, the old IBM world where you got a suit and tie, like that is the world. And here's how you do it. And I wasn't that guy. I completely, I was not yeah. that person. So it took a few years of identity kind of searching to be the musician creative that I was. Now it's a part, it's a part of our culture. Like I, I've written songs on this journey of limelight that, that speak to me. I've sung, I have the tiger over a new employees that we hire and I do a way better version yeah. than the original. Sorry. Unless you're working out, my version isn't as good if you're working out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's actually the passion's been become a part of our culture, which I think is huge right. and very authentic. And so now, and you brought that with you into this space that at one point we could have said felt divergent, but in fact, it's all, it's all just Garrett. That's right. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. The other thing I love about that entry point is how simple it started. You know, we talk about MVPs or minimum viable products. And I think a lot of people fail to understand just what minimum actually means. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is a thing that, that started with a couple of hours or a couple of days worth of, you know, it's the, it started in the garage sort of metaphor, right? Yeah. Um, but that was enough to get it going. And that was enough to get it in front of some people that could actually partner with you and, and take this somewhere. That's right. Um, so it's easy to see Limelight today as this, you know, juggernaut of growth and this thing that's raised all this money and and some pretty impressive and exciting stats of where you guys are going. And you go, man, I could never do that. Well, can you sit down for a couple of days with a friend and build something that's kind of that solves a very simple problem? Yeah, most people can. Yep. Yeah. So as this thing began to unfold and you, you form this partnership and you get some traction in the market, I assume, um, along the way, you guys have done a pretty good job of raising money and raising funds. Um, what's that like? Well, uh, it's definitely been a, a roller coaster. Uh, and if I, if I take it all the way back again, before we started Limelight, I came to the pitch breakfast, right? To just speak to, to the local community here. Um, and I, I pitched, it was just myself. Alan was busy cause he had a day job. So he was just me. And, um, uh, you know, I, that led to a, a bunch of good feedback, which led to us, you know, coming back to the Shasta angels along with Launchpad digital health in San Francisco and some early seed investors that we went to that kind of started us when we got our first round of funding. So pitch breakfast was a part of that story to get funding. They said, Hey, you should get a real team. Not that I didn't have a real team, <laughs> but, but it was, you know, again, this is a big yeah. complex industry. And it, so I went, I found Jason Andrew to run the company, or he would say that he found me to have the product, right? So all of us have our, our story, but the four of us came together and, uh, you know, Jason was good, uh, very strategic in the fundraising. So was Michael. Michael had some long-term industry friends that again, between Jason and Michael, they, found some early investors, right? And we had a prototype from them. When we got funded, Alan and I, because we went to the small group focus, we we couldn't just stay on a phone. I love phone mobile apps. I can't wait to design one and be, because it'd be, I love them. But we we went to a native iPad. That was our, that was our working prototype that we literally sold. It was, a, it was somewhere over a hundred thousand um, dollars of, of sales off of a prototype. Okay. And, and that was part of the traction that's describe what you mean by prototype. What do you, what is this? Yep. What's that idea? So, um, a prototype, um, meaning Garrett could go in and just blow the masses away with this iPad app that wasn't really real data. Um, um, cause, cause again, <laughs> um, it actually was real data in California. I'll, I'll talk maybe a little bit more about our product a little bit later, but it was, uh, so prototype meaning it wasn't in the iTunes store, right? It wasn't, public, you go download it in iTunes yet. Um, so we had on my iPad, our prototype, which basically allowed you to manually enter in a few employees. And then you could run plans in California for some of the carriers uh, and see health insurance benefits, only health insurance, only California. 
uh, and we had sliders and dials, but because it wasn't being really used for people to run their business, right? That's the power of a prototype. It literally needs to tell a story and people need to see their problems being solved with that prototype. So it, uh, you know, that's who we went to in California and showed it to them and there's yeah. nothing like it. No native iPad. You couldn't go sit in front of an employer and slide dials around and say, you pay this much, the employees pay this much. What about Johnny, your key employee? Well, we could do all that in real time on an iPad and it just felt and looked incredible and, and enjoyable. And that's not what our industry industry is known for. It's not enjoyable. It's paper, it's spreadsheets. It's, it's very inefficient and you schedule meeting after meeting because you can't answer questions in real time uh, when you're shopping mm. for benefits. So, so you built a prototype that had it it worked to a, to in a sense, but it was really designed to tell a story to help people understand what the product really was. But you couldn't you couldn't actually engage it very deep. It was would you call it thin? Was um, it a thin experience? I would say but just enough. Well, so or, again, it was just enough. Again, it was it was we we went about it more as a sales tool, more as a hey, provide value to your customer as a broker. Where whereas we had missing features, so totally what our competitors were legacy 10, 20 year old systems, but they had the features built in a very legacy non sales tool, meaning you would never show these legacy systems in front of an employer. But we were created solving this problem of functionality that our competitors weren't solving. Um, and so it was thinner, but more sales focused. Once the data was in, here's all the cool stuff you can do, but getting the data in, actually proves to be a difficult, that was where we needed to build in those other features. But since it's a prototype, we were showing you the experience of, oh yeah, the data's already in, it's all ready to go. Uh, and now you're sitting with an employer helping them make a good decision. Ready, go. And you guys did a hundred thousand dollars worth of revenue just off this prototype that's missing features and missing data and all this stuff. You just yep. launch. Yep. Yeah, cool. All right, cool. So you get a prototype built, you're starting to get some seed funding coming in. Um, but the funding journey has been, there's been more to it than that, right? Yes. Um, again, we've been through three rounds, uh, technically. So we have, we had a, uh, a seed round, uh, and which again, Shasta Angels was a part, a number of, of the angels that there, um, Launchpad Digital Health. And then that was our seed, it was a few hundred thousand, I think 500,000 or so. Don't, don't quote these numbers. And then, um, that helped us started hiring some employees. We did an A round, um, a few years ago, two to three years ago. And then this last year, it's more of an A plus, but A plus slash B was another load of, mm -hmm. of funding. So we've been through three rounds of funding and, and every round has been different. Um, and every round has required a lot of effort from all the co-founders in the team. And then now when you have real customers, it's different kind of like fundraising pre without customers versus you know, with customers, because then it's like, oh yeah, yeah, okay. So let's talk to your customers, right? It's just a different- What's the difference? Well- Yeah, what's that experience like? Um, I mean, it's, it's different because you can't just ride on the vision. You have to actually, the execution of, of customers actually using your product to run their business. And, 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 you know, you read articles about it, it takes 10 years to build good software. There's some real, there's a really good article. Um, I, I can give you the link for it later, but 10 years. Okay. So we're like one to two years in. So it wasn't a matter of like our product was the A plus plus plus. It was that we're making traction. We have momentum. It's not easy with customers. Like it's not all perfect. There's still stuff missing, but we're making progress and they are using the product. Uh, it's very difficult in the SaaS software as a service uh, space. Um, but to say that, right, part of the fundraising is, oh, great, let's talk to your customers versus there's none to talk to uh, before. It was just, wow, I'm super inspired. This vision, wow, there's a big problem. You're going to solve it. It's going to be awesome. Then it was execution um, by customers actually using it. So by going through multiple rounds of fundraising, what you're what we're saying there is you've been vetted numerous times at numerous different stages of this project and people continue to say, yes, we still believe in you, but we believe in you because now you're actually producing measurable results. We can talk to end users. We can, and if those end users aren't happy, it'll show up and funds dry up. That's right. And, and, and I would say part of the pivot for us in the fundraising was we started with a broker product. 
Okay. On an iPad, great meet with an employer. And then after that, we ended up going and pitching, um, one of the largest insurance companies on the planet who was coming into the United States to do an insurance carrier, kind of like principal guardian met life, right? These are big, right? Carriers that sell dental and vision and life and disability. I made another prototype, uh, on the iPad for these other product lines because we only did medical. Okay. And we sold the brokers. So we pivoted and realized that insurance carriers, they're the ones that distribute their products. We have to, it starts with them. It starts with them being efficient. We offer prototype, we pitched it and sold a deal where now the insurance carrier was our customer, which was a whole nother level, a complete whole nother level of, of functionality, product, full desktop, a whole bunch of features that brokers don't need but it's all connected at the end of the day. That's, that's what makes us really different and unique. But that led to our, our, uh, our A and our B was really the fact that we had a carrier product. That's, that was a big part of the change and the shift from a fundraising perspective. And that probably gives you access to a much larger total addressable market at that point. Yeah. Both in the U S and uh, global. Yeah. Nice. So can you share with us uh, where you guys sit in terms of metrics right now? How much have you raised? What's revenue looking like? Give us you know, some sort of scope or scale of where Limelight finds itself today after coming through this journey. So we to date have raised uh, between the C, the A and the B, just over 10 million. Um, you know, we've got about 100 employees. We're probably 20 or 30 positions that we're hiring, right? So we're growing a ton in our Reading office, San Francisco office, and a Des Moines uh, office in Iowa. Um, and then our revenue uh, is continuing to grow. We're not cash flow positive. There's a lot nice. of revenue there, but but the fundraising is, is helping us feed to continue to grow, to get uh, the foundation that we need to really scale over the next uh, two to three years. Yeah, that's one of the challenges of this type of business is you actually have to It's a long dip about, you know, that it's a long way. You got to build, build, build. And during that period of time, you're often not cash flow positive. You're continuing to raise money to get to this sort of, it just takes time to get to these big numbers. So I want to shift gears here just a little bit, because now we've got some kind of context about how you guys got started and how you got to the scale you're at today. Um, But as a, as a person who's engaged in getting a startup going, from Garrett's perspective, what's your experience like? Um, Patience has been a big one for me. Um, I'm always, I'm a pioneer. So I, it's good as a co-founder, you got to pioneer new ground, solve problems that haven't been solved before. Um, That creates a lot of tension, right? Uh, Of, of being ahead. Like you, you've got something to sell before it's even needed. And that was how I was wired, which is, I don't just want to make a better typewriter. I, I grew up, you know, seeing Steve Jobs, even though I didn't agree with the way he built his company, but the vision that he gave the world, I resonated with that. And so did the whole world. Um, and he was ahead of the market, right. And in many ways, and we started in, in my mind, I w- I've been ahead of the market because we've got, I'm saying, Hey, use an iPad. It'll be so awesome. Sit with the employer, right. And you can do this in real time. But you know what? People don't do business that way. So I'm trying to change a way that business has been Mm. done for 10, 20, 30 years. And you know what? That was painful because they go, well, does it work on Internet Explorer 6? And I go, no, it's an iPad. And right. So it was this whole shift of (laughs) of, of learning patience to slow down. And and interesting, because I I'm always I was the co-founder that was always we're going to build this feature. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. I mean, we literally prototyped OCR, Kirk, OCR technology to take a picture of a bill that had census data on it and convert it into census data of employees with their dates of birth, their names and start quoting them health insurance options in on the spot. Right. It was like James Bond feature that helped us actually sell off a prototype, get investors because they thought, oh my gosh, these guys are the net, they're, they're completely thinking bigger and beyond what the existing. And that feature never went to production, okay? But it was a part of our journey of innovation and pioneering that I was really, that was, I was all about. Cause I just, it, to me, that's what people wanna be a part of where it's going and they need visionary people that 
care about the how we get there and and that are doing stuff and and that was a part of my my process i was terrified extremely when we went from a broker to a carrier solution okay hmm. because once we went to carrier what scared you about that because i i was a broker so i worked with carriers um some of our other co-founders had more experience with the carrier underwriters right we're talking about Mm. hundreds of factors to calculate a rate for a dental plan. We're talking about mm -hmm. any, you know, 200 different features of a dental vision or life or disability product to then roll up. So it's a whole bunch of information I wasn't an expert on. And I literally, there were days when I would, I felt like I was in the fetal position inside my heart, underneath my desk, because I was in over my head. So that was a part of my journey as the chief product officer, which is what I started at. Um, and that was part of us letting go and, and growing the team and getting people that were smarter than we all were, right? Which is huge and all part of the process. Um, and I just remember days where I was like, I just need to not, just need to keep going, just need to get up in the morning. And I know my head's racing on, I don't know what the answer should be. And I talk to different subject matter experts or can't find them. And I have to make decisions on the best that I know as a product, you know, organization, that was difficult and terrifying and exciting. Um, and I've changed my role a ton. So I've moved throughout the organization, which is my journey. Um, I was chief product officer, co-founder, right? I was over customer success, feeling the pain, talking to our customers mm -hmm. who loved us, some who didn't love us. I ran marketing and made videos and I want to make people cry with video and, and visuals and understand and connect with their heart on why we're in the insurance business, right? So marketing was huge for me. Then um, I helped QA the product um, and I've really, now I'm on the enterprise sales team. So all of Garrett, authentic co-founder, visionary, uh, and now I get to help sell and I'm super being fulfilled, spending time uh, selling. What would you say was the, um you know, we, in, in the entrepreneurial, or specifically the startup journey, we talk about the Valley of Sorrows, which is what I hear sort of coming through there. Fetal position under the desk, right? That's got to be some low points. Um, what did you learn about yourself through this project? Um, letting go. I, I have been known to be a controlling person. Uh, my wife but my, uh, and my kids, right, might say that. But it's true. Uh, letting go has been one of the biggest uh, journeys for me uh, because we've, you know, you can't get to 100 people and take on money from other people and not pivot and, uh, again, make a lot of changes to have to let go and trust the team that you have. And some you like don't even know them, but uh, for a month, all of a sudden you got some critical hire. And I just, I don't even barely know them. And here they are making big decisions. We have to keep letting go. I wrote a song. Uh, coming back from uh, Omaha to San Francisco. It's called Omaha to San Francisco. And literally it's just a talking about letting go in my head and my heart. It was through a big process with a big potential customer and um, super intense. And I wrote a song just because I, for me to enjoy this, I have to let go and trust that whatever's going to happen, you know, good or bad or ugly, that it's going to be okay. There's a, uh, a uh, collection of research that one of the professors at Harvard in their business program put out in a great book, um, founding or startup dilemmas. It's called Noam Wasserman, I think is his name. And he talks about this very specifically as being one of the biggest challenges that startup founders face is they have to make a decision and it comes very early. Do you want to be wealthy or do you want to have control? And that dividing point is very, very important to know because one is not wrong and the other one's right, but you do have to choose, right? And you've gone down the lack of control, which we hope someday produces, you know, that's still to be seen, I'm sure, the wealth side of it. But, and it's very, very challenging to walk, walk through that. I think, you know, it's like, for me, the, the having, the, you know, having a, a, uh, the abnormal amount of vision when we started as one of the co-founders that um, saw stuff that didn't exist. And I was very creative. That was the creative side of me to let go of that. And, uh, you know, it's like they didn't come out with the iPhone and it didn't have a, a camera on it to start. And it was hard for me to basically step back from a, hey, how can we actually financially actually get to stability 
if we tried to, you know, release iPhone 10 on day one, even though they they had that vision, they knew it was going to happen. There was a there's a step by step process to get there. Selling a lot of iPhones, you know, and a lot of merchandise, you know, iPhone merchandise financially to get the revenue to be able to pay for the whoever built the iPhone 10. So totally. So, and you know, if I had to wait for the iPhone 10, I would be. I would be disappointed because I, I had a good experience with the four. That's I mean, the great. antenna was screwed up and it was too small and blah, blah, blah. But I didn't know any better at the time because as a consumer, I don't have the vision for the 10. Yeah, that's right. I would say, you know, one of the biggest struggles, again, because I, I, I listen to all our customers. So I'm a very cross-functional, you know, role as a co-founder. It's very hard, but part of my, you know, process is we're getting feedback and some of the feedback from customers is good. Other of it, they're not thinking about certain stuff that we're thinking about, that I'm thinking about, that I know five years down the road is completely game changer. And so it's taken in real feedback um, to give them a better typewriter as they know it. Because you can't just change you know, the business process. And it, this is B2B, yeah. B2B. We can't change it all, man. It takes years to change a process, even though there's been times where I would show our product and one lady at it w- would say, um, I don't know. I, I I like my process, and the and the owner of this you know um, company would say, "Are you kidding me? This is going to change our whole world to be the coolest thing ever." But she didn't want to change, and even it took weeks longer to do quoting. And she was like, "I'm fine with it. This is what I'm used to." So that right. that's just a real struggle. And now it's not about that's it's not about features, and and it's it's about psychology at that yeah, point. It's change management. Right. I'm telling you, man. Totally. Status quo change management. One of the biggest. And supporting Internet Explorer, which is just the worst. I wish they just 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 get rid of it. Come on. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Cool. Thanks. Obviously, there's a, a lot more ahead of you in your journey with Limelight Health. And there are a lot more things that are going to have to happen that will unfold. And I hope to come back in a couple of years or sooner and be able to get the update. Right. But you are way down the road compared to where many of us Set you, Limelight Health is an aspirational company coming out of the Reading startup ecosystem, and I'm wondering now that you've experienced so much, if you were to look back at a at a potential founder or a couple founders that are trying to get something going, they've identified a problem, they're beginning the work of building their first MVP. What would you want to say to them? I would say, uh, great that you found a problem. I would say go bury yourself, immerse yourself in this problem and either feel the pain firsthand or just get extremely close to someone, friend, family, you know, business, wherever that is living in that pain and just sit at their well and take it in because without, you know, the, the, there's a problem and we have some equation to solve it, but, but I think burying ourselves in that pain, feeling it and getting empathy to really when we actually solve it, and that's what makes us very powerful because we've lived the pain as co-founders in our company. The empathy that we have uh, is very real and it's very attractive uh, in, in our industry and, and I believe in the world. So I would say you got to get some empathy. So either um, feel it firsthand or connect with those that are and then figure out the team that you need. You know, I've got others that you know I've talked to some folks that are like, OK, I want to do this, start this company. And and it's a it's a mobile app. And. And they're like, oh. and I go, okay, great. So do you have a, like a technical co-founder or someone who can build it? They're like, no, I don't want to give away the equity. And I'm thinking, this is like, you're, it's not good. You're, it's like scarcity thinking you got to keep, keep, but you have nothing. You have hundred percent of nothing. You're doing a technical, actual mobile app. You need a technical co-founder that can shred and stay up all night and get this done. So find the right team. I would say Reading specifically my journey, I don't believe Limelight Health would be here without the Reading startup ecosystem. I do believe that it was, it's been, it's a part of my story from the pitch breakfast to Hope Seth when she first got the EDC up and running. Um, now Todd Jones, which is great, going to three startup weekends that literally have marked my life, not only mine, but my kids, my wife. Uh, and uh, st- yeah, staying connected and encouraged by others. That's been a huge part. And we need that synergy. So if you're in Reading, you need, and I'm not just plugging it because I think it's a good idea. It actually is a part of my story. And I, I want to give back and be a part of the ecosystem to continue to share my journey. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's huge. And then, 
uh, I would say just start pitching what you're doing uh, and pitch it, whether it's pitch breakfast, whether it's, you know, the startup community, friends, family, whoever, just be pitching your business. Uh, do your little make believe shark tank pitch. And, and if it doesn't make sense to anybody, then you probably don't have much, to, you know, but you have a little, <laughs> a little ember. Um, that's good. I would yeah. say do a startup weekend. There's a startup weekends coming up. Just do one of those. That's a great way. Um, and then make a prototype. I would, uh, I helped my son start a bow tie company. Uh, the first three ago, the startup weekends was way easier than what I'm doing with limelight health. Um, but we made a prototype. My son made it. It was horrible. It was like the worst when I wore these bow ties that he made. When you like lifted up my collar and saw how the cutting was just the worst ever and he glued it together. But I wore them because I was, I'm your dad. I'm going to, I'm going to wear these, um, make a prototype, sketch it out. If it's an app, you don't need to go spend five, $10,000. You don't, you don't need a technical co-founder first. What you need to do is get a notepad out and you need to get it out on paper. I don't want to hear you talk about, you need to go hire somebody to build it and whatever. No. You just need to put it, make it tangibly visible on a piece of paper with a pen. Just that alone, no money. If you can't do that, you're not going to get a technical co-founder. If you know, they're going to be like, if you can't visualize it, then he can't build it. He or she can't build it. So I think that's hopefully helpful. Many of us know that you are quite a musician. Um, we've heard Eye of the Tiger, your version of it. But I don't know that we've heard from Omaha to San Francisco, which sounded like the song that came out of at least one of the Valley of it Sorrows. Did. And there's a guitar right well, behind you. There is, Kirk. Do you want to debut that song for us? It's been a great uh, source of, of peace. I've got a bunch of my instruments set up in my office. And, you know, we, got, we have actually attracted, strangely enough, lots of other musicians that are developers, right? And customer success and... So I've got my hammer dulcimer set up, a lap dulcimer and a guitar. Uh, that is a place where we try to take breaks. I've sung it to the team here probably a few months ago, but yeah, this, this is, uh, this is some, some debuting Kirk. So, um, I'll just do a, like a shortened version. Okay. So yeah, here it is. Omaha to San Francisco. Um, this is written, uh, on a, during a limelight journey, um, this last year. Omaha to San Francisco You taught me how to let it go From that bay back to my home I'm drowning in the great unknown Letting go in my head and my heart Like a stone in the hand of the Pharisee Like a stone in the hand of the Pharisee I don't know where the road will Watching you hang on a bloody tree The cliff I jumped off let me fly Like a Roman candle on the 4th of July I'm letting go in my head and my heart, yes I like a stone in the hands of the Pharisee I'm letting go in my head and my heart Like a stone in the hands of the Pharisee Francisco.
Francisco You taught me how To let it go Thanks, Garrett. And thanks for spending some time telling your story today. Yeah, thanks for making a place. If you'd like to know more about Limelight Health, you can find them at limelighthealth.com. They have a lot of jobs available right now, and, and they would love to talk to you if you have some skills that match up with what they're looking for. You can also find out more about what's going on in the Startup Reading ecosystem by visiting startupreading.com or just find us on Facebook under Startup Reading. If you search that and like our page, you'll get all the updates and announcements and information about our pub talks, the upcoming uh, Startup Weekend that we're going to be holding in November, and all the different ways that you can connect with Startup Reading. I'd also like to thank all of you that have been giving us uh, great feedback on this podcast. We'd love to hear more from you. If you want to send us messages, leave notes, you can do that. You can always shoot me an email at Kirk at iconcoaching.com that's kirk at i-k-o-n coaching.com for uh, your reviews or thoughts or input all of that kind of stuff the more we connect the more we engage the more we participate the better our ecosystem will become